Um, so I'm glad everybody is uh, joining us tonight. My name's Chrissy Smith, and I'm the executive director for the Friends of Nitars Bay Watershed Estuary Beach and Sea, which is a really long name, and we uh, like to abbreviate that to WEBS or Friends of Nitars Bay WEBS. Um, WEBS works to sustain the Nitars Bay area through stewardship and education, fundraising to support various different in-person and virtual education programs like tonight, and hands-on field-based STEM um, programs for K through 12 students. Our goal is to help our community and visitors to this special place appreciate the unique habitats and ecosystems that thrive here, how to explore them safely and responsibly, and to leave having an experience that inspires them to help protect and conserve these places for future generations. We are also a proud member of the Explore Nature Partnership, which is a multi-organizational effort spanning Tillamook County with, like -minded, with a like-minded goal. Um, this partnership works to help connect communities to the local natural resources and natural resource-based industries along our stretch of the coast. If you want to learn more about the Friends of Nature's Bay Webs um, or our Explore Nature partner, you can um, find, um, find out more online by visiting the websites that are on the screen or by visiting our social media channels. Uh, tonight, we're super pleased to bring to you a pair of presenters, um, including Dr. Shay Steingass with the Marine Mammal Program Leader, who is the Marine Mammal Program Leader with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. She's going to be presenting on her work around harbor seals. And accompanying her tonight is Jim Rice, the Program Coordinator, the Stranding Program Coordinator for the Marine Mammal Institute at Oregon State University, who will be presenting on marine mammals ashore, responding to uh, strandings in Oregon. We're super excited to have both our presenters here tonight. Um, harbor seals are an iconic uh, species for us. You know, they're, they're hanging out in Neatarts Bay all the time. Um, and we also, um, just this year, had a pup stranded. And so it's well time to have Jim come and share about strandings in Oregon and what to do when you do see a mammal uh, on the beach. Um, and so we're super glad that they're coming and they came here together to share all this information. Um, so the way we're gonna handle tonight is we're gonna eat, give them each a turn. Um, we're gonna start with Dr. Steingass. And um, once she concludes, we'll have a question and answer session and then I will kick it over to Jim. So I'm gonna take a moment to introduce Dr. Steingass and what I'll do is I'll stop sharing now so that you can get your screen share going, Shay. Um, Dr. Steingast, like I said, is the Marine Mammal Program Leader at Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Her research includes marine biology, habitat uh, modeling, behavioral ecology, marine resource management, an application of cutting edge technology and interdisciplinary methods to answer applied and socially relevant ecological questions. Dr. Stangas is an advocate for effective science communication and believes that telling the story of science in an accessible and inspiring way is just as important as research itself, which is a quote that I found very endearing. So I really loved reading that about you. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna hand it over to you to talk about harbor seals. Great. Um, okay, so first of all, I can only see my PowerPoint. So um, I wanted to make sure, can you hear me okay now? You're coming through loud and clear. Awesome. Okay, just wanted to <laughs> do that before I commence here. So, um, well, thank you, Chrissy and, and Paul for having me. Uh, this is a really cool opportunity to talk to you guys um, at a site that's pretty important to me. Um, and it's also really great to be talking to you tonight along with Jim. Um, and to pair up, uh, that's probably something we should think about doing more uh, is joint joint presentation. So um, as Chrissy introduced me, um, I'm Shay Steingas. I'm the Marine Mammal Program Leader for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm also a graduate of Oregon State University uh, and currently am affiliate faculty with the Marine Mammal Institute there and um, courtesy faculty with the uh, Department of Fisheries, Wildlife and Conservation. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is a combination of the current work that I do with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and the work that the folks in my program do, as well as some interesting data that 
uh, I have from 2014, 2015, when um, I put tags out on harbor seals in Neatards Bay, uh, as well as down at Alsea Bay. Uh, so I hope this is interesting and uh, we'll learn a little bit about harbor seals as well as the specific animals that inhabit Neatards Bay. So a bit about our program. We are a collaborative research and management program for pinnipeds in Oregon. So pinnipeds generally refer to seals, sea lions, uh, fur seals, and uh, the walrus. So obviously there's no walrus in Oregon, but they are a pinniped. Uh, we look at the ecology and behavior primarily of seals and sea lions, and we work very closely with federal, other state agencies and tribal partners to do this. A lot of what we do has to do with population assessments and we conduct these through various methods, uh, visual observations, and we also have a really great uh, unmanned aerial vehicle or drone program that we use to try and catch resites of individuals and do counts of seals and sea lions. And we also just completed about two months of flying aerial surveys in a fixed wing aircraft to look at the populations along the coast. Uh, one of our other things that we do is work with Jim and the Stranding Network uh, to assist if there are stranded animals, uh, if samples need to be collected. And uh, we also end up collecting some data and hearing of some data through the public that we uh, pass along. We're located all over the state. We have folks up um, around Portland. We have folks that work up out of Astoria quite a bit. Uh, I'm located in Corvallis, actually. It's kind of a central hub. And uh, we do have staff down in Gold Beach as well. So something I wanted to get out of the way first stuff is uh, the difference between uh, seals and sea lions. Um, often we'll get mixed reports of somebody saw a sea lion, but it's a seal or vice versa. And in Neatards Bay in particular, you mostly see harbor seals there. So they are a member of uh, the family of what we call phocids or true seals. Uh, you can see on the bottom right there, that is a harbor seal. These guys are spotted in gray. Uh, unlike the larger brown sea lions that you'll also see on the Oregon coast, uh, they can sit up, as you can see, they move a lot better on land, and they are the ones that bark. So harbor seals don't really tend to make many noises. Uh, so if you hear barking, that is a sea lion and uh, not a harbor seal. So thinking about the harbor seal, uh, we have about approximately 10 to 11,000 of harbor seals in the state. We just as I said, uh, conducted those aerial surveys and are in the midst of counting them right now. And we will have that data probably in the next year or so, but as far as we can tell, these populations have been stable for quite some time across the state. They're not, they're not continuing to grow. And uh, in this case for you guys, where you can see harbor seals are on the spit of Neatarts Bay and in the estuary. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And like I said before, this was actually the site where we were able to conduct a study a few, just a few years ago to understand the behavior of these animals. Um, harbor seals eat a variety of fish and they eat anything from small flatfish to sand lance, which are those little fish that bury themselves into a uh, sandy bottom, perch, squid, or even small octopi. Uh, they have a pretty varied ecological niche. And in particular, the seals in Oregon are composed of what we call a mixed population of foragers, meaning that some animals are specialist in what they do and some are generalist. Um, and what this kind of creates overall is a large mosaic of uh, food habits or ecology of these animals. So the population as a whole is really diverse even though some individuals might be fairly specialized. And because uh, harbor seals go where the food is at, their behaviors at sea uh, correspond with how specialized their dietary niche is. And some of the 
uh, research I'm going to talk about is actually satellite telemetry of harbor seals, meaning we actually tracked them at sea. And these are some of the maps of animals. Um, the two on the left were animals that were captured and uh, had tags applied in Alsi Bay. And the one on the right was actually an animal that was captured and tagged in Neetarts Bay. And we're going to keep going back to this animal because it's, it's a really interesting story. And as you can see, this guy didn't really move at all. Um, you can see the two animals in the, the middle and the left panes. Uh, one moved really extensively along the coast and uh, went all the way from Alsi Bay, bounced up to several, several estuaries and actually went into the Columbia River. The red areas you see there are actually what we call the core area for this animal. So that is um, where essentially oh, at least half of their location points occurred, meaning these are really important areas for this particular animal. And so you can see that that really consists of a series of bays and estuaries, uh, including the Tarts Bay. And the blue area that you see in those dots, that is 95% uh, of our locations were in those particular areas. So uh, what was really cool to see with this study and we'll see in the next couple of slides is they in a way kind of painted the continental shelf of Oregon, meaning that they didn't go beyond that um, isobath or depth, depth range uh, into the deeper ocean. And that was really interesting data to find. We kind of assumed that was the case, but this was just really interesting. So how do we know what animals are doing at sea or just in general? Um, there's many different ways we can mark animals and you can see my poorly conducted uh, Photoshop there on the bottom right. So a few things we might do is use a flipper tag, which is actually a tag you would use for like, um, they're actually sheep tags that you would see in a sheep's ear. Um, so we punch a little hole through the webbing on the flippers uh, you know, it's much like ear cartilage. It's, you know, there's not many, um, there, there's not much, too much sensation there and it doesn't really bleed. And so it's a really kind of easy and innocuous way to put a tag on an animal so we can learn more about it. Um, sometimes if animals keep showing up in the same place, Jim might go out there and use some temporary uh, oil paint or a uh, specific marker that Stranding Networks use to paint a little bit of green or something on top of that animal's head. And that's really helpful because if we have a, an animal that keeps showing up uh, and we get dozens and dozens of reports of that same animal, it's easy to say, oh no, it's the same one that's been there. And lastly, uh, the most permanent thing that we do to mark pin of heads is um, is branding. And this isn't really done for harbor seals in Oregon in particular. We just don't do that. Uh, but for many pinniped populations, uh, this is what, for example, the National Marine Mammal Lab uses to mark animals. And it's incredibly invaluable because we can go back and find an animal year after year. And that's how we understand how long they're able to survive in the wild. Um, a lot of times those flipper tags over time will wear out or pop off. And uh, a brand is really the only way to mark an animal throughout its life. So um, a really great example of this is that uh, a um, somebody on the beach found a flipper tag. Uh, it was a deceased seal and it had a flipper tag on it. So he brought that information into us and we realized that uh, actually just today or yesterday, that uh, that was an animal that was actually tagged for a diet study back in 2000. So this animal wasn't even a pup at that time. It was an adult. So, uh, you know, without that information, we wouldn't know that animals can live 20 or more years in certain locations. So that was that was really cool to see that we could we could get that data. Um, and I would encourage any of you, you know, to be on the lookout for things like that, because that's how we inform uh, what we know about populations. So as I said, there's a couple other ways we can study harbor seals and pinnipeds in general, and that includes those aerial surveys that I just talked about, or drone surveys, which are really fantastic. Uh, they're a great way to get really good imagery of individuals and populations at certain sites. 
The other thing we can do is collect scat or tissues from individual animals to analyze their diet. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. And um, one of my favorite methods is uh, like those maps that you just saw, and that's uh, satellite telemetry. So uh, what that means is putting an instrument on an animal that communicates with satellites and using that to triangulate locations. And it's kind of a little joke that I have where uh, I called them HATS, and you'll see why. Um, and I made up the acronym, which is a, a Harbor Seal Interior uh, Telemetry System, because we put them on their, on their heads. So let's talk about this a little bit. Uh, this is what one of those devices look like. So you can see there, that's actually just glued to the animal using a really quick setting epoxy. So we have a team here from um, Humboldt State University, San Jose State, and even the Alaska Sea Life Center that came to do this work. And uh, what we do is we actually were able to catch the animal in a net. Uh, then we move it onto what's called a V board. And it kind of looks like one of those life flight uh, platforms that you would put somebody on. It's a, um, like a stabilizing board. Um, we're able to hold the animal, we cover its eyes so that you know, it doesn't have any eye damage and it reduces stress. And really within a couple minutes, we're able to take a couple samples from the animal, put the tag on and, uh, oh, I do have a video and it's I hope it's working, but, um, yeah, not very fast, but they will, <laughs> they move back to the water. And as soon as that animal hits the water, this tag starts to transmit. And then every time the animal is at the surface, it uh, sends a location to satellites. And so this is really interesting. Um, these tags that I showed you, they actually use the Doppler effect. And you might be familiar with that. Uh, in terms of the sound that a train makes or any a car as it goes back uh, past you, you can hear that frequency shift. Well, the satellites can do the same thing with the transmission of these tags. And depending on where the tag uh, frequency shifts as it goes by, the satellite estimates a location. And when you have multiple satellites pass by this animal, you then get a triangulated estimate of where the animal is. So satellite tags are great because your data can then be transmitted to the lab. Um, there are tags called GPS tags that are really accurate, but you have to get them back. And it's very difficult to get a tag back from an animal, as you might imagine. Um, if you put a tag on a seal and try to come back four months later and get that tag off, it's, it's gonna be hard not only to find that seal, but to try and catch it and get the tag off. Um, and it's a whole ordeal. So. Uh, satellite tags are fantastic for that, but there, there are some issues with them. And that is that, uh, as I said, if you only have one or two satellites going by, you can imagine that it's really difficult to accurately triangulate a location. So you might be able to uh, calculate it like by latitude, but you're not going to get that third dimension. But fortunately, there's a lot of really great statistical techniques that we can use that actually use the track line data to estimate likelihood of these locations. And these locations are then weighted, as you can see, and we get some clearer track lines. So um, I think this is almost artistic. This is uh, 24 animals that were uh, had tags applied in 2014 and 2015, uh, both in Alsi Bay and Neetarts Bay. And as you can see, each one of these different colors is a different animal and they are so unique in the way that they use their environment because that's how they essentially share resources. Uh, if they were all going to the same spot to forage, there wouldn't be any food. And they typically learn these behaviors from their mothers. Uh, and so, like I said, when you have really specialized individuals in some cases, the population as a whole is very variable. What you might notice from this map, however, is that clearly there are no seals going into the middle of Oregon. Uh, and so you can actually apply another tool. This is something that NOAA developed to correct for shoreline locations. And you get a really clear map of what these animals are doing. Um, you can actually see one animal went pretty far up river uh, in Neetarts Bay and both up kind of by, um, I think that's kind of by like Siletz. Uh, so that's the final product of what you get when you track animals. And you can see the amazing difference between number one and number three. So uh, 
I use this data to estimate all kinds of things about the behavior of these animals. And as you can imagine, for an animal at sea, uh, we don't know what they do most of the time. So we were really lucky to be able to put these tags out. So in total, uh, these 24 animals uh, had a total of 606 days, a span of 606 days where there were tags on them. Um, in total, we got over 57,000 locations, which is really great. So what's most interesting, or one of the key findings I found was that uh, animals that we were able to catch and tag in Elsie Bay moved around a lot. Uh, they are the animals in orange there. So that is all of the pooled data from every animal in Elsie Bay and where they went. And then in purple, you can see the Neetarts Bay animals and they really didn't move nearly as much. We had one that went up to the Columbia River for just a little bit and one that went down to Nestucca, but it was really interesting to see that the Neetarts animals that we tagged, and again, we tagged um, just as some background, all male, all adult male seals, uh, the Neetarts Bay animals really stuck around a lot more. And it's hard to say why, it could be because the continental shelf is narrower up there, as you can tell by that black line. Whereas Elsie Bay animals, it's a bigger population. A lot of them ranged more, so they weren't competing with each other. And a lot of them went out to Hecata Bank, which is that really wide area of the continental shelf. So there's some kind of preliminary information on what these guys do as soon as they leave the beach. And um, something that we found very interesting was the average individual like core area, really important area for them was about 30 square kilometers, but this varied a lot. And uh, in particular, we had one animal in Neetarts Bay that I was gonna talk about that just was really interesting and does give a little bit of a window about how specialized and really interesting these, these animals are. So there's Neetarts Bay. And uh, it is just one of 90 haul out locations on the Oregon coast. Uh, and if you would like to know more about these haul out locations or how we conduct those aerial surveys to study pinniped populations, uh, you can, the easiest thing you can do is search ODFNW Harbor Seal story map. Um, and we have an atlas of the haul outs as well as a really great uh, kind of a slide presentation of how these aerial surveys are conducted. Uh, I, I think it includes some video and some really good photos, uh, and you can learn about how we count these guys. So out of those, you know, 90 locations, uh, of the 24 animals that we did tag out of uh, Alsea and Neetarts, they really focused on a number of key estuaries and uh, you might not be too surprised that Neetarts Bay and Alsi Bay were key components of that because that's where these animals were coming from originally. And um, you can see that there's just a variety, including uh, Yuquina Bay, Depot Bay, Siletz, Tillamook, and all the way up to the Columbia River that were really important areas for these animals to go both hang out in the bay, probably and look for food, but also go on shore to rest. And um, you know, as a result, it was really, it was really helpful to see that animals tagged in different bays visited a lot of different areas. So you might see seals in Neetarts Bay and assume that it's the same animals day after day. Um, and maybe for Neetarts, that's the case, but certainly for all seed bay, it seems to be there's a, there's a rotation of the population of who's present at what time. Uh, what was really cool again was over 99% of our estimated locations were right on the continental shelf. Uh, so that really did hammer in the point that the shelf itself is extremely important habitat for these animals. And really anything deeper than that is just not utilized by harbor seals in particular. So I wanted to tell you a little bit, a little story of one of these seals. Uh, this was seal um, it had tag number 61773. So you saw that really broad map. Let's go back to uh, where all these animals went. And I got this data back and was so confused or concerned because this was over, I think this was almost three months or over three months worth of data. And in these three months, this animal barely traveled a kilometer. 
uh, it just stayed in one spot. And so you can see on the left there is Neatarts Bay. And if you zoom in a little bit, that's all it did. It just sat there. Um, meanwhile, I had all these other animals traveling all over the place. And that was just really curious because you start to think, well, maybe your instrument isn't working or should we throw this data out? Um, but fortunately, we were able to collect some other data that really kind of told us maybe what was going on. And so this was kind of a fun example of how combining multiple techniques can tell us about an animal. So we start to wonder, what, what is this animal doing? You know, an animal is really a combination of, when you study them, it's a combination of where they're going, what kind of behaviors they have learned in particular from their mother, uh, their life history, you know, what is their story over time? How old are they? What do they eat? Um, and diet specifically, what, what kind of food makes up the majority of what they're foraging for? Uh, so these are all pieces of a puzzle that tell us about both animals and the population as a whole. And we're able to study diet definitely through SCAT. Um, and that's a really great way to get at population level um, assessments of diet because you can go out to a haul out, you can collect a bunch of SCAT and you could look at it and say, okay, all the animals in Alsi Bay are clearly eating X, Y, or Z. Um, but it's really hard to pin that down to individual. And so in this particular study, we were able to collect tissues from each animal that we sampled. And one of these tissues was a whisker. And whiskers are one of my favorite things in the world because they are both incredible sensory organs, but they also just contain a multitude of data. And this can include anything from stress hormones to contaminants. Um, and in this case, I was able to look at the composition of what are called stable isotopes. And so as a little bit of background, every element has a stable isotope. And you may have heard of radioactive isotopes. Um, well, stable isotopes are kind of similar, but they're much more common and they're actually inert. So they're not reactive, they're not dangerous. But essentially what happens is atoms of a certain element, so let's say nitrogen, can actually accumulate just one extra um, molecule, so one extra neutron. And uh, what this does is makes it weigh slightly, slightly more. So as you can see here, nitrogen 14, as we all know from the periodic table, uh, nitrogen it has uh, or 14 um, gosh, protons and neutrons, or yes. Uh, and so when you add just one more, you add one more neutron, uh, it weighs slightly more, just a tiny bit more. And because these guys are a little more reactive than their nitrogen 14 cousins, they're a lot more rare. So you can see here 99.63% of nitrogen atoms are in 14, whereas point three, seven percent are nitrogen 15. And the really cool thing about these isotopes is that the heavier versions of the isotopes tend to accumulate up the food chain, kind of like heavy metals do. Um, and so we can actually look at these and learn about the animal's diet without even looking at one thing that it's eaten. So I took these whiskers and sectioned them off and uh, Carbon was, is a great way to look at the marine environment because it can tell us about whether um, this animal is foraging in an offshore or nearshore environment. So carbon, again, that's a key component of plants and that's the base of both, both terrestrial and marine food webs. Nitrogen, on the other hand, is maybe even more interesting because that one can tell us where in the food web an animal is eating how high up. And, uh, for things like marine species, this is especially important because it can tell us if an animal is eating mostly salmon or flatfish or invertebrates. And this is what I honed in on for this particular study in the Tarts Bay and Alsi Bay. And had I not had this data uh, regarding what the animal tended to eat, we wouldn't have any context for that, that satellite data. And so what we found uh, when we looked at the nitrogen, and this was so cool, um, this corresponded with the spatial behavior of animals. And in particular, 
you can see here, so the, the purple represents animals that were from Neetarts and the orange represents animals that were from Alsi Bay. And the wider this bar, the more varied their diet is. Uh, the higher it is in this plot, the higher up the food chain. So here you go, uh, we have 61773, this little seal. And not only does it have a really narrow range of diet, which makes sense, but it's much higher than any of the other animals. And the reason this is really cool is because it validated this, this spatial data and told us that, okay, no, this wasn't a big error. This animal has a very specific foraging strategy that it's figured out. And uh, it doesn't have to move because it's already got life figured out. And why, why would you go anywhere if you didn't have to? So, um, you know, I was never, never able to conclusively validate what this animal is eating, uh, but we had a lot of discussions. And I think the answer to this particular animal is um, it was probably eating crab, either um, probably maybe crab around crab pots or crab that were just in the near vicinity. Because um, when you think about, you know, shellfish, you think, oh, they're lower on the food chain. But as you all know, Dungeness crab eat whatever ends up on the bottom of the estuary or bay. And so the isotopic signature of a Dungeness crab can actually make it look like more of a predator than top predators because they eat everything, um, including crab bait. So the isotopic signature and the nitrogen of these guys can actually look like they're top predators. And so that was our guess as to what uh, this particular animal was eating. And um, I think that's just a really cool study because that's how we find out what these animals are doing um, when we can't just see them sitting on shore. And so uh, that seal may still be out there. I don't know. And I'd really love to get back out to Neetarts Bay and, and do some more research on the harbor seals there to learn um, what they're doing in particular. And if there's more individuals like that one that just stick around. So we um, just did aerial surveys, as I mentioned, and uh, Neetarts Bay was included in this. And I thought this was kind of a good map because it shows a lot of really good um, shellfish and crab locations. Uh, as you can tell, there's a lot of dungeness, so that also kind of backs up that crab theory. Um, but if you want to see harbor seals in Neetarts Bay, the two starred locations are the places I would recommend. And so these were spots where when we flew over several times, there always seemed to be animals kind of hanging out there. Um, you can access them if you're walking around on the spit or um, conversely, if you're kayaking or crabbing or even just across the bay, you can use binoculars to watch them. Um, and they're, they're great to watch. You'll, you'll see that they often will track you if you're walking on the beach. Um, they can't see very well out of water, so they'll kind of pop their heads up and try and figure out what you're doing. Um, they, uh, in spring, they will have pups, and I think Jim's gonna talk a little bit about that. So they're just a really great iconic species that can tell us a lot about the environment and uh, ecology of estuaries, and so, I hope you're all out there to uh, go out there and enjoy them. And I really regret not being able to do a, a field trip with you all. Um, so that being in, uh, having that in mind, I thought I would talk a little bit really quickly just about you know, how you can watch marine mammals. Um, and this is just a reminder that, that marine mammals are federally protected and that's all of them. So it means it's illegal to disturb or harass them. Um, the recommendation is to stay at least 150 feet away from these guys and to really just be aware, you wouldn't believe how many animals we see that are in altercations with dogs or um, you know, attacked by dogs, et cetera. And this is really problematic because you know, A, they, you know, they're wildlife and should really be kind of left, left alone, but um, they can also carry diseases that are transmissible both to humans and uh, pets. So if you do see an animal that seems to be sick or stranded, uh, you can call that animal into the stranding network and uh, Jim will go out and assess it and figure out if anything needs to be done. Uh, and we'll talk or Jim will talk a little bit about uh, harbor seal pups and what that means when you're out there 
observing uh, harbor seals and you might come upon a pup that seems sick. And in fact, it's actually probably not. So uh, that'll be great to hear from Jim on that. And with that, uh, oops, I just wanted to give a really kind of brief overview of harbor seals in Oregon and Neatarts Bay and what we're doing to study them. So I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I hope it raises some questions. Uh, if you have any questions on these guys, I mean, uh, we can obviously answer them now, but you're also welcome to email me. And with that, I'll go ahead and stop and let Jim pick it up with the Stranding Network. Great, thanks, Shay. Um, before we hand it over to Jim, we did have a couple, we had a question come in and I encourage um, other folks to um, ask questions if you have them. We can get a few questions into Shay right now and then um, and then let Jim and then any other questions that come up, you certainly can, um, we can ask them at the end too. We did have one person who asked, how do you avoid nesting seabird disturbance when you use drones? Yeah, so, um... We essentially we fly at a certain altitude uh, and we have to do this for marine mammals anyway. We have to stay, you know, usually at least 150 or more feet above uh, them. So when we're flying at that height, you know, the technology is really at a point where we can get an amazing high definition image without really disturbing anything. Um, and we actually have, we do have regulations where we cannot or can fly in certain areas due to conservation status of species. Um, or in particular, when we, uh, for example, fly uh, at the US Fish and Wildlife Service refuges on the Oregon coast, we get express written permission to do so. And they actually will give us information too that says, hey, stay clear of this area, this is going on, et cetera. So, um, you know, if we do, and same thing with marine mammals, anytime we're flying a survey and we actually start to notice disturbance, we'll stop. Awesome. Um, uh, another question um, here is, um, I've heard barking like sounds in the bay. There were harbor seal babies. Could the babies and the mothers be making the barking like sounds? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> so harbor seal pups do vocalize, but uh, you know, it's funny, one of their, um, their name actually means sea calf. And the babies in particular make kind of sad little baby noises and they can be pretty loud. Um, I'm not gonna try and do an impression. No. A lot of times it kind of sounds like, a, like, like they're saying ma, ma. And uh, that would be the sound that you would hear. Um, and it does kind of sound like a sheep or a cow or something. Uh, but, um, you know, our sea lions do pop in and out of bays sometimes, and their, um, their voices can carry quite a distance, you know. So I remember when I lived in Newport, pretty far away from the docks, I could hear the barking, uh, particularly in like evening or morning hours when sound carries better. So, yeah, if you're hearing that very specific barking, that is actually uh, definitely a California sea lion. Um, stellar sea lions make kind of a really loud grumbling, growling noise. Um, yeah, so it depends what you heard, but uh, you could probably look up videos of harbor seal pups. Yeah, I, I kind of think of harbor seals as like snorting. Would that be like, you know, they just sort of make yeah, a snorty noise. Snort. And the <laughs> males will make grunts and noises underwater too when it's mating season. So sometimes mm -hmm. you can hear that, but um, definitely not as loud as their um, sea lion uh, companions. And some. Um, we, I don't blame the, you know, that harbor seal for sticking close to home. We all like to stick close to Neat Tarts Bay here too. So, um, but I thought that was really interesting. And do you ever work with um, like folks like Tony who do all the clam surveys to kind of try and figure out like where would be a potential hot spot for um, seal diet, you know, like kind of where's the diner, where's the smorgasbord? <laughs> yeah, well, and that's definitely a lot of what we do. So Susan Reamer is our diet expert here with the program. She works with Jim for the Stranding Network as well. And she does a lot of that scat analysis where she actually goes through and looks at, I mean, she can get down to species in terms of what these guys are eating. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely, you know, it's funny that Dungeness crab thing. I always, always meant to follow up on that. And because we would essentially take some tissue, freeze dry it and look at nitrogen 
to confirm and we just never got that far with it. Um, but we work a lot with the shellfish folks and they actually inform us about things like demoic acid, et cetera, because that can affect marine mammals as well. And we'll start to see weird, weird things happen <laughs> when those, when those blooms happen. Awesome. Um, well, keep um, popping your questions in. I'm going to introduce Jim. So we have sure to have time for Jim as well. Um, and then at the end, we can just pose questions to Jim and to Shay as you guys um, have things that come to mind. Um, so um, Jim, if you want to go ahead and start pulling up your screen, you should be able to share here. And I will introduce Jim. Jim is the, as I mentioned in the beginning, he is the Stranding Program Manager with the Marine Mammal Institute of Oregon State University at Hatfield Marine Science Center in Newport. Jim is a graduate of the University of Vermont and began his career as a marine mammal trainer at the Mystic Aquarium in Connecticut. He later worked at Roger Williams Park Zoo in Providence, Rhode Island, where he studied cognition in California sea lions and African elephants, which is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> he later served as a biologist with the New England Aquarium in Boston, where he coordinated marine mammal and sea turtle stranding response, oversaw husbandry and medical care to animals and rehabilitation, performed necropsies and conducted studies of harbor porpoise habitat use in Boston Harbor. He has managed the Oregon Marine Mammal Stranding Network since October of 2005. Thank you so much, Jim, for being here with us and sharing about your work and mammals that come ashore. Thank you, Chrissy. It's wonderful to be here. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you just great. Great. Thank you. So thanks for that introduction and thank you, Shay. It was great listening to you speak. Um, it's always great to hear you. And um, remembering uh, your dissertation work when you were doing the Harbor Seal works uh, in Neatarts Bay and Alsea Bay. I got to help you a couple times and that was a big thrill for me. Um, getting onto strandings now, we, uh, as Shay mentioned, all marine mammals are federally protected species. So just to give a little background about um, stranding networks overall, um, we are all basically covered through a legal agreement we have with the federal government through NOAA Fisheries. Um, Oregon State University um, is the recipient of one of these agreements called the Stranding Agreement, and basically it gives us the authority to respond to marine mammal strandings so that when we do engage with a marine mammal, um, we are not in violation of the Marine Mammal Protection Act as we otherwise would be if we were to um, somehow interact with, with a mammal that's on the beach. And only folks that are officially authorized by NOAA Fisheries uh, may handle marine mammals, and that includes state agencies like ODFW. Um, so we, we have authorization and folks that volunteer with us are also authorized by virtue of our stranding agreement with NOAA Fisheries. Um, the area that I cover is basically um, from Tillamook south to the California border. Stranding response um, is handled by Portland State University and the Seaside Aquarium uh, for the northern part of Tillamook Bay and up through the southern um, Washington coast up to the Long Beach Peninsula of Washington. So we share the Oregon coast with, with other folks who, who help with stranding response too. Um, the objectives of the stranding network um, are varied. Um, primarily, we are involved in the scientific investigation of marine mammal stranding events and trying to understand the health of marine mammals and uh, the events that, that lead to them becoming distressed or dead. Um, so we are constantly surveying for diseases. We're looking for infectious or emerging diseases, um, diseases that are in some cases transmissible to people into domestic animals and um, documenting instances of human interactions. These would include things like ship strikes or entanglements in fishery gear or gunshot wounds. Um, and we work closely with the uh, diagnostic laboratory at the OSU Veterinary College of, College of Veterinary Medicine in Corvallis, um, and they provide us with pathology services. So it, it's a wonderful benefit of having a vet school uh, close by um, part of OSU that we can work closely with and derive some good detailed information about our findings um, through necropsy. 
Um, we also work um, a fair amount with live animals. In fact, um, probably about 25% of the reports of strandings that I receive are of live animals. Um, and in most cases, it's our objective to somehow try to mitigate harassment to these animals. Now, most people that encounter a seal pup, for instance, on the beach, do not intend to harm the animal. They do not mean to harass it, um, but their very presence on the beach is in, in fact a form of harassment, especially if the animal um, is affected by um, what the people are doing. If, if you cause the animal to flee into the water um, or if you uh, cause the mother of the pup not to come ashore to take care of it, um, those would be considered harassment. Um, and certainly if, if a dog were to run up to a pup or any other marine mammal on the beach um, and harass it, perhaps even to injure it, um, that would um, be another sort of harassment, a more severe form. Um, and we also work um, to the extent that we're able to, to um, mitigate or disentangle uh, marine mammals that are um, entangled in either marine debris or in um, fishery gear. Um, and this does happen from time to time, both with whales as well as um, seals and sea lions. And a lot of what I do is working with the general public um, and trying to advance a sense of um, awareness about marine mammals, their natural history, their needs, and the fact that they overlap with human activities and try to minimize disturbance as much as possible. I maintain a, a stranding hotline and I answer on average about a thousand calls a year, um, often by people that are visiting the coast, often from out of town or even out of state. And in many cases, these folks are not familiar with what they're seeing on the beach and they are desperate for information. They wanna know um, about the animal's status and um, what they can or should not be doing um, to promote the animal's welfare. So we deal a lot with informing people about the do's and don'ts about um, what to do if you see a marine mammal on the beach. And a lot of my job revolves around reporting strandings to the national database that's maintained by NOAA Fisheries. So whenever I get a report of a stranded marine mammal, um, it's then incumbent upon me to collect as much information as I can to um, inform um, NOAA Fisheries and, and other folks about um, the breadth of the strandings that are occurring along the Oregon coast. Um, now, if we have a live animal on the beach, uh, rehabilitation is generally not an option for us. The state's policy is basically to let nature take its course. Um, we don't have rehabilitation facilities for marine mammals in Oregon, and there is an administrative rule um, with ODFW, which specifically prohibits the um, rehabilitation of marine mammals um, in the vast majority of cases. There are some exceptions to this, but by and large, most live um, seals and sea lions and dolphins and whales um, do not have rehabilitation as an option for them. Um, in some cases, exceptions can be made, specifically if, if it's a depleted species, a, a species of concern, um, or if it's an animal that's been impacted by human activities, such as an entanglement or maybe a, an animal that's been um, injured by a dog bite or something of that sort. Now, last month, we actually had a rescue that occurred in Oceanside. And some of you, I'm sure, are aware of this. In, in fact, I'm assuming that some of you are listening to this talk were actually present on the beach the day this happened. Um, this was a live newborn stellar sea lion that appeared on the beach in Oceanside early in the morning on a beautiful summer's day. And it quickly drew attention from passers-by um, wanting to um, get close to the pup, find out what it was, poke it with sticks, maybe try to push it back into the water or what have you. Uh, this was a very rare event. We generally don't get stellar sea lion pups that come ashore. They are generally born on offshore rocks, um, such as the Three Arches Rocks, um, just offshore of uh, Oceanside. And in this case, this animal had probably washed off the rock inadvertently and had come ashore and was basically a healthy pup, but was dependent on its mother 
and it was extremely unlikely that the mother had any idea where the pup was and was certainly not going to come ashore on a busy crowded beach and attempt to nurse it. Um, so the pup basically was not going to survive and it could not be left on the beach um, given the, the popularity of that beach and all the human activity. Um, so the decision was made to collect this animal and it was brought into a rehab facility. It is currently at the Marine Mammal Center in Sausalito, California, and it's doing quite well. But this was an exception. This is not something that we typically do and it's not something we would expect to be doing much of in the future. Much of what I do is the collection of data, um, basically to determine what animals are coming ashore, what types of animals, um, their species, the locations, their age classes, their sex, their status, whether they're alive or dead. If they are dead, whether they're recently dead or if they've been dead for some time and are showing signs of decomposition. Um, if there are any signs of human interaction, for instance, net entanglement or gunshot wounds or ship strikes. Um, and if there are any tags or brands, Shay and, and other folks who are um, part of these tagging efforts would certainly benefit from knowing about resites of tagged and branded animals. It really helps inform um, their knowledge about where these animals go and um, how they spend their time and how long they live. Um, so this is all important information that we can gather even from a dead animal that's on the beach. Um, to give you a sense of the types of strandings that we get um, over time, generally speaking, we see a lot of pinnipeds, seals and sea lions in particular. Um, and here's a picture of a very sick California sea lion representing the pinnipeds. Um, in the red, we have the cetaceans or the whales, dolphins, and porpoises. We get relatively few of those compared to the pinnipeds um, and those are um, represented here by the harbor porpoise. This is the most commonly stranded cetacean that we have in Oregon. Um, and we also get a number of cases of animals that are not technically considered stranded because they are otherwise healthy, but they do make use of the ocean shore and they do stimulate um, stranding response to some extent. Um, folks will find these animals alive on the beach. They will report them as being stranded and that will generate process where we have volunteers go out or in some cases uh, me or, or other stranding network personnel uh, to assess the animal and uh, post some signs maybe to help keep people um, from bothering the animal. Um, and this is represented by an elephant seal that's molting on a beach. Um, so we get generally six or 700 strandings on average a year, plus a number of um, other cases of, of animals. Um, that are not necessarily stranded, but are um, on the shore. Um, and they, they do um, demand a certain level of response from us. Um, as far as pinnipeds go, California sea lions and harbor seals make up the majority of the um, pinnipeds that we get. Um, they are far, um, by far the, the most commonly stranded uh, pinnipeds that we have in Oregon. Um, and the cetaceans, as I mentioned before, the harbor porpoise is the most commonly stranded um, cetacean species that we have. Um, and this is actually the time of year when harbor porpoises are most prone to stranding. Um, just in the last week, we've had a half dozen or so reported to us that have stranded. Um, most of these are newborn calves that have somehow gotten separated from their mothers and washed ashore often uh, because they're malnourished and they're not able to survive on their own. Um, I thought I'd pull together a few uh, stranding uh, data points um, regarding the greater New Tarts Bay area, just to give a sense for the types of strandings that have happened there. Um, and here they are since 2015. So in the past five and a half years or so, um, there's a fair number of uh, different species that have shown up. We've documented 15 different species, um, basically between the tip of Bay Ocean Spit and Cape Lookout. Um, and most of these are on the ocean shore. Um, we've had a few within Neecharts Bay, but most of them are, are on the outer shore um, and certainly on the spits of uh, Bay Ocean Spit and Neecharts Spit. We certainly get a lot of um, stranded reports from those areas. Um, quite a number of cetacean species, incidentally. We've had things like a northern right whale dolphin, striped dolphin, Pacific white sided dolphin, um, and there was a humpback whale that was reported last year off Oceanside that was entangled 
we believe in crab gear, although we were not able to confirm an entanglement, but the animal was behaving in a very unusual manner and remained in a very um, confined area for several days um, before it disappeared. Um, as far as pinnipeds go, um, we've seen all six different species of pinnipeds that we have uh, documented in Oregon, the California sea lion, the stellar sea lion, the Guadalupe fur seal, the northern fur seal, the northern elephant seal, and the harbor seal. Um, I should also mention um, there's two species that uh, have been documented here that are not cetaceans or pinnipeds. One is the sea otters. We've had two sea otters strand uh, in this region um, in the last few years. Um, one was at Cape Mears in January of 2020. And then in February of 2021, we had a sea otter um, strand um, at Cape Lookout. Both of these strandings um, were freshly dead animals and they both had shark bite wounds on their bodies. It's believed that they were attacked and killed by great white sharks. Um, we also had a Olive Ridley sea turtle that stranded at Cape Lookout in December of 2016. So a red, relatively diverse uh, number of species um, are prone to coming ashore in the greater New Tarts Bay area. Um, as I mentioned, there are six species of pinnipeds that have been um, documented along the, the Oregon coast. And as Shea pointed out, um, we have phocid seals or true seals as well as odoriad seals or fur seals and sea lions. Um, so within the phocid group, we have harbor seals and northern elephant seals. And then within the odoride group, the California sea lion, stellar sea lion, as well as the two fur seal species. Um, there's a number of um, misunderstood things about pinnipeds that I'm frequently um, trying to clear up when people report animals to me. Um, people have misconceptions about these animals when they find them on the beach. Um, and the first being that if they see a, a seal that's dry on dry sand um, and has been out of the water for hours, um, they assume the animal needs to be back in the water. It sh should not be on the beach in their minds, but it should best be in the water, it should be wet. Um, and this is completely not true. Um, pinnipeds are fully adapted for extended periods of time out of the water, and they are quite um, well adapted for that. Um, they do not need to remain wet. In fact, in some cases, if, if you have an elephant seal, for instance, like this one on the slide, um, they can spend many days, if not weeks, out of the water um, for certain physiologic needs that they might have. For instance, they go through an annual molting process once a year. Um, in which case they stop eating and they basically shed their fur and their skin uh, during that period of time. Um, also during breeding seasons, uh, seals and sea lions generally do not uh, eat. Um, they will spend long periods of time out of the water while they're uh, focused on other things, you might say. Um, they do need to come ashore though on a regular basis to get rest. This is a physiologic need that they have. Um, they will not remain in the water indefinitely in most cases, um, at least the coastal species that we have along the shore here. Um, there are pelagic species that will remain offshore for many months at a time without hauling out. But by and large, sea lions and harbor seals will come ashore daily um, to get rest. And it's important that they are allowed to get rest, um, otherwise um, they become exhausted and they can become immune compromised and become sick. Um, when they are on land, they move around very awkwardly. They are not graceful on land. And folks will often watch a seal humping along on its belly, moving very slowly uh, to get back into the water. And they'll assume that it's an injured animal and it's not able to move properly. Um, but that's simply not true. These animals are adapted for both the water and for being on land. And they have made some compromises in their ability to move around. Um, in order to, to be able to move in both mediums. Um, so it's normal for a seal to move slowly and awkwardly on land. Um, it's, it's not a sign that the animal's sick necessarily. They also rest on their sides quite a bit with their flippers up in the air. Uh, that doesn't mean that one of their flippers is damaged or inoperable. It simply means that that's their preferred posture for resting. Um, they can also go for long periods of time without eating, especially if they are sufficiently 
fattened up prior to a molting or a breeding season. Um, so it's, it's not necessary that they be in the water hunting for food constantly. They are designed to go for long periods of time uh, without eating um, as their biologic needs dictate. And basically they should be left alone if they're encountered on the beach. There's no level of human interaction that's gonna be beneficial to these animals. They do not seek out human company. Um, it's only gonna stress them out. So it's, it's really best to give them lots of space. As Shay said, 150 feet is the recommendation or 50 yards um, and that's to minimize stress. Um, any time that the seals are having to look up at you and worry about what you're doing is time that they're not able to focus on rest. And um, if they're constantly on alert, they are suppressing their immune system to some degree. And they are, um, it's overall can take a toll on, its, on the animal's health over time. Um, harbor seals, as, as Shay mentioned, um, have been, uh, we've been experiencing their breeding season um, since May. Um, and um, they are generally born in the middle of May and um, they continue, uh, the breeding season continues through June generally. Um, and the pups are generally quite small and helpless when they're born. Um, they are dependent for their mother, on their mothers for about a month. Um, so uh, during that time, they will nurse periodically throughout the day um, with their mothers. The mothers will often um, leave the pup unattended on the beach while she's off in the water foraging. Um, and she will generally return to the pup and sometimes the pup will join the mom in the water and they'll swim together. Uh, but the pups get tired very easily. They are small, they don't have much muscle mass, they don't have much blubber to insulate their bodies to stay warm, and they get cold very easily. So the pups need to spend a lot of time on shore getting rest, um, and the mothers need to keep track of where they last saw their pups so they can rejoin them and continue nursing them. Um, and this can become a problem when people interact um, during the pupping season, in particular, um, when people encounter a pup on the beach, um, there's often a desire to want to um, investigate the pup, maybe interact with it, maybe people feel the need to put it back into the water. In some cases, they may want to pick it up and take it home with them and uh, see if they can maybe raise the pup themselves. Um, these are completely uh, strictly illegal and they're um, inappropriate <laughs> to say the least. Um, there's no level of care that any ordinary person can do that's gonna be able to uh, sustain a pup's health. The pup really needs to be left where it was less uh, by its mother. Um, <clears throat> if the pup does not reunite with the mother, the pup is not gonna survive. It really needs its mother to take care of it. And generally speaking, the mother and the pup will continue uh, doing their their thing quite well, as long as people don't disturb that process. Um, so we spend a lot of effort trying to minimize disturbance by helping to educate the public and volunteers are instrumental in this, um, posting signs and um, helping to maintain a safe perimeter around a resting pup. Um, and this is primarily during the month of May and June. Um, we caution people not to be tempted to take pictures of pups, certainly don't touch a pup or pick it up. Um, the guy who took this picture posted his picture on Instagram and within a few hours, um, I think he learned to regret that decision. Um, he was publicly ostracized. <laughs> um, and uh, well, I'll leave it at that, I guess. Um, but basically we wanna send a positive message to people that they, um, the best thing they can do to help the pup is to leave it alone and not to interact with it in any way. Most people are well-intentioned, but poorly informed. And um, it's our job to help better inform them and give them the, the right information so they can make good decisions. Um, a lot of bad decisions are made just because of naivete and um, ignorance, unfortunately. Um, so helping people to understand that if they see a pup that's on the beach, and as Shay mentioned, they do make a crying sound. It's, it's, it's hard to listen to and not feel compelled to wanna to help the animal. But rest assured, the best thing you can do is leave the pup alone because the mother um, in the vast majority of cases is out there and she is still taking care of the pup. 
Um, there are lots of situations where pinnipeds come ashore alive, and it's, it's often difficult to know right off the bat whether the animal is in fact considered a stranded animal or if it's just simply a resting animal. Um, one way we know for sure if an animal is stranded uh, by the definition laid out by NOAA fisheries um, is if it's dead. Um, dead marine mammals are by definition considered stranded. So any dead marine mammals um, that you might come upon, um, I would certainly want to know about so I can properly document it and report it. Um, if it's a live animal, um, it would be considered stranded if it's not able to get back into the water for some reason. And this, in most cases, is due to um, some sort of a physical obstruction that might prevent the animal from getting back into the water. Um, this could be if a seal, for instance, swims through a culvert and enters into a, a smaller estuary and cannot find its way back into the culvert and back into open water again. Um, sometimes seal pups will manage to get themselves behind a giant rock formation and um, maybe be separated from where its mother last saw it. Um, we've had seals and sea lions wander inland. We've had sea lions climb cliffs and end up crossing highways and um, approach people's private property and land on their front door st stops. Um, any number of oddball <laughs> cases like that would cons be considered a stranding if the animal's not able to get back into the water. And we would certainly want to try to help get the animal back into the water, or at least give it access to get back into the water. And of course, if an animal is critically injured or sick, it's considered stranded if it's not likely to survive on its own. And in some cases, animals are just out of their natural habitat. They have traveled very far from where they're known to um, exist. Um, I used to work in Boston and um, we had a beluga whale that um, had made its way down from the Gulf of St. Lawrence in the Canadian Maritimes uh, down into Boston Harbor. Um, this was a beluga whale that was by itself and it was um, behaving in an odd way, but it was still swimming and was not necessarily showing signs of distress, but it was considered a stranded animal. Uh, despite the fact that it was still free swimming. Um, we monitored that animal for quite some time. Um, and it turns out the Canadian government did not want the animal relocated back into Canadian waters. Um, so he was left where he was. Um, we often, as I mentioned, we have uh, animals that come ashore to get rest. In some cases, they're elephant seals that are going through a molting process. Um, this is an elephant seal that came ashore at South Beach in Newport this past winter. And he spent the better part of a week on the beach at South Jetty, um, moving around quite a bit from day to day, um, probably moving 50 or 100 yards a day. Um, so the signs that we posted to advise people to stay away um, had to be relocated <laughs> pretty much as often as the seal was moving around. Um, I was actually contacted by a reporter from the local newspaper, uh, the News Times in Newport, who wanted to do a story about this seal. Um, and I was happy to talk to him about the seal, but I was a little concerned he was going to publicize the location of the seal and draw more attention to it than it was already receiving. He assured me that he would write the article um, in such a way as to make sure people knew that if they saw the seal, they should leave it alone. Uh, but in any event, I was still concerned that uh, the story was likely to draw attention to the seal. But it turns out the seal um, was sufficiently rested after eight days on the beach and decided to head back into the ocean the morning that the article uh, went to print. So that was good timing for the seal. Um, this is a normal occurrence during the winter and spring months in particular um, with elephant seals that come ashore. They often appear to be in distress. They will just often lie there on the beach making growling noises and letting uh, people get up close to them. They do not flee when they're approached, generally speaking. They will tolerate quite a bit of disturbance, um, but the accumulation of, of all that disturbance over time um, will um, wear on them and it, it will uh, cause them health problems. So we really um, ask that people stay away when they see an animal on the beach like this. Um, when seals and sea lions come ashore, it's a normal process, as I said, in many cases. Um, when a whale or dolphin or porpoise comes ashore, um, it's generally a sign that the animal is profoundly sick or um, perhaps dying. 
Um, these animals are not designed to come ashore and they cannot survive out of water for any length of time. Um, and in many cases, these animals are, are quite sick before they even um, land on the beach. Um, but in some cases, we do have healthy animals that come ashore um, and the very process of coming ashore does cause a cascading of negative physiologic processes that happen. Um, for instance, the blood is shunted away from some of the organs in the body and um, organs that are deprived of oxygen cannot survive. Um, the animals essentially go into a state of shock after, um, in some cases, a few hours on the beach. Um, and that will generally lead to death within a few more hours. Um, so if there's any hope of recovering a live whale dolphin or porpoise, um, it's um, prompt immediate attention is, is generally called for. Um, here in Oregon, again, we don't have rehabilitation facilities. So um, trying to stabilize a whale dolphin or, dolphin or porpoise um, will not necessarily ensure its survivability. We can try to make their um, situation more comfortable by providing supportive care on the beach. Um, but even putting the animal back into the water is generally not advisable, um, again, these animals are often coming ashore because they're profoundly sick and sick dolphins and whales and porpoises are not likely to survive simply because they're put back into the water. Um, however, if, if there is a, a single stranding of perhaps a harbor porpoise, um, this is a species that could potentially be refloated and um, may be able to recover. We've had a few instances where this has happened um, because of their small size and their the fact that they live close to shore to begin with um, lends them probably to be more likely to be um, refloatable, rescuable, as it were. Um, but even uh, harbor porpoises, in most cases, are when they strand, it's because they're profoundly sick with um, perhaps uh, pneumonia or some other disease. We get a lot of reports of live whales that are close to shore that people think are stranded or in the process of coming ashore. Um, and this is a quick video clip showing a gray whale that's foraging on benthic prey in the um, surf zone, basically. This is off Glen Eden Beach here in Lincoln County. Um, this whale is almost close enough to reach out and touch. And um, to the untrained observer, um, this animal certainly looks like it's on the verge of, of landing on the beach. Um, but in fact, it's, it's out there, it's, um, it's foraging for many hours at a time um, on dense patches of um, prey, um, primarily mycid, uh, little crustaceans, um, or crab larvae, um, or some patterns this time of year, especially. Um, just in the last couple of weeks, I've had a half dozen or so calls about folks uh, reporting gray whales close to shore, people um, very concerned thinking that a whale that spends six or seven hours at a time in a very small restricted area must be distressed, must be sick or maybe entangled because um, people, um, but with gray whales, um, it is the case. <laughs> it took me some time to learn this when I moved out to Oregon from Massachusetts 15 some odd years ago. Um, if I had a whale close to shore in Massachusetts for a prolonged period of time, that would certainly be an indication of a distressed whale. But here in Oregon, with gray whales in particular, it's quite normal for them to forage close to shore. The sorts of behavior um, in this video where they will persist for, for long periods of time, um, seemingly in distress, but actually um, enjoying the fruits of all their labor uh, by foraging. Um, now, as I mentioned, the vast majority of the strandings that I respond to that we hear about on the Oregon coast um, are dead animals. Um, and in this instance, our objective is to document the um, situation as best as we can. So this generally involves um, collecting a set of photographs of the animal from different aspects of the body, um, getting a good sense of the animal's body condition, any um, wounds that might be on the body, um, in this case, you can see the eyes have been pecked out by scavenging birds, um, which it's kind of gruesome, I guess, to look at, but it's actually quite normal. Um, and it's, it's not a sign that anything had happened to the animal while it was alive. That's a post-mortem change. 
Um, we did necropsy this adult female stellar sea lion, and it turns out she had a severe case of salmonellosis, um, basically uh, caused by an infection in her abdomen that spread um, to her lungs. Um, this is just one example of the types of um, diseases that we see in marine mammals, often bacterial or viral um, or fungal infections um, that affect them. Um, Working again with the diagnostic lab at the OSU vet school, um, we've been um, doing pathology workups on animals for about 15 years. And there are some common disease um, findings that we um, have been determining. Um, in California sea lions, for instance, we see a disease called leptospirosis quite often. And this typically affects the animals during the fall months. Um, California sea lions, incidentally, are on their way north right now. They've been down in Southern California for the breeding season since uh, mid-June. And they are just now making their way back into Oregon. And this is about the time that we start seeing animals perhaps succumbing to um, the rigors of the breeding season and the migration and the swapping of germs <laughs> that inevitably occurs uh, during that time of year. So we are likely to see some sick sea lions showing up on area beaches in the next few months. Um, with harbor seals, um, in addition to uh, the pups that we get a lot of calls about, um, we see um, cases of protozoal um, meningitis meningoencephalitis, which is basically an inflammation of the brain and the tissue surrounding the brain. Um, and this is often caused by protozoal parasites, um, little microscopic bugs basically um, that are found um, in the fish that these animals eat. Um, and the, the fish are basically infected Uh oh, it looks like we lost um, Jim there. Uh, so hopefully he'll be able to hop back on here in a second. And we will be able to um, finish up his presentation. So um, let's see. So I, I will share in the chat the story map that um <laughs> that uh, Shay um that Shay shared in her presentation so everybody can check that out and Shay if you don't mind humoring us we did have a couple questions come in about pinnipeds while we're waiting for Jim to rejoin yeah you bet I'm still here um I'm glad that wasn't my computer I was like oh no I think I just lost <laughs> so yeah uh so the one question I have is the primary predator of pinnipeds. That's mm -hmm. that's really nice alliteration. I like that. Um, so uh, generally here, you know, something something folks don't realize about the Oregon coast is we actually have a lot of sharks. It's we don't see them like we would on the East Coast or other locations because they're fairly far offshore. But um, great white sharks are prevalent here, and they are absolutely a predator of harbor seals. Um, and other sea lions. So when we performed our, our captures and tagging in 2014 and 15, I can't recall what year it was, but we actually temporarily caught a female harbor seal that had a huge shark wound healed on her. Um, and actually we let her go because we figured she'd had enough stress in her life. So uh, <laughs> get, let her go immediately. Um, so, uh, Sharks are definitely one, and the other one are transient orcas. So there's two different populations of orcas. There's the resident and there's transient. And resident orca pods only eat fish. And um, they are one of those populations of concern in terms of uh, not having enough salmon to eat, essentially. You, I'm sure you've heard of that on the Oregon and Washington coast. Uh, but the transient orca pods uh, actually do eat pinnipeds, and I've been in the bay when uh, orcas make their way upriver, and it's really fascinating because all of the sea lions, uh, this was in Yaquina Bay in Newport, all of the sea lions went completely silent and just 
kind of hunkered down except for one guy who didn't quite get it and he kept kind of barking. Uh, and so, yeah, so those are the primary ones. It's uh, killer whales and larger sharks, predatory sharks. Awesome. Thanks. Jim, you're back. I am. I don't know what happened. I'm sorry. <laughs> My it's okay. Kick me off Zoom for some reason. Um, <laughs> you got back really quickly. I made you a co-host again. So if you want to pick up. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry about that, everybody. That's okay. We we just popped in a couple questions while you were gone, so okay. we filled the time. Great. Um, and I will try to hurry along here. I was talking about neurobrucellosis, I think, um, when I was last um, talking. Um, and this, again, is a, a neurologic um, issue, mostly with dolphins that we see um, from time to time. And it's mostly with a species of dolphin known as a striped dolphin which is a species that's um, generally found in temperate and tropical waters. And over the last 10 or 15 years, we've been seeing more and more of them um, off the Oregon coast. Overall, uh, the disease process we see most um, across the board in marine mammals is pneumonia. And that's sort of a generalized term. It could be caused by any number of things. Um, it's often caused by lungworms. Um, it's also caused by protozoal parasites like toxoplasma and sarcocystis, as I was mentioning earlier. Um, and sometimes it's caused by um, fungi. Um, so uh, we, we just need to look at these cases carefully to determine what the cause of, of these different pneumonias are. But basically respiratory infections are, are a prime problem um, with marine mammal health overall. Um, over the last few years, we're also um, involved in what's known as an unusual mortality event. Um, and this was, um, this is a situation that's been described by NOAA Fisheries. Um, it's a formal declaration that they made um, basically because of elevated numbers of strandings of gray whales along the entire West Coast from Mexico to Alaska. Um, starting in 2019, you can see on the graph here, the orange bars represent the year 2019, which was the peak of this mortality event, compared to the black bars, which is the 18 year average uh, between 2001 and 2018. Um, so we had really high numbers of sick and dead gray whales coming ashore. Um, and uh, for reasons we have not fully been able to describe yet, um, there, as the name implies, this is an unusual mortality event. It's an investigation basically um, being conducted primarily by NOAA fisheries, but also uh, researchers um, throughout the region, including those from Mexico, the United States, and Canada. Um, as far as we can tell, most of these whales that have been succumbing to this UME have been malnourished. In some cases, they're emaciated. Um, we've also seen signs of killer whale predation on a fair number of them. Um, and a paper recently came out describing poor body conditions being associated with uh, this unusual mortality event. And the current thinking right now is that changes in the Arctic ecosystem have had a profound effect on um, the ability of gray whales to sustain sufficient um, fat reserves during the summer foraging season. Um, gray whales spend the summer months up in the Arctic for the most part, up in the Bering and Chukchi seas. Um, and then they migrate south where they breed off the coast of Baja California in Mexico. Um, and for the length of that migrate, migration both north and south as well as the time they spend in the breeding lagoons in Baja they're basically not eating for the majority of, of the year. Um, they really need to put on a lot of weight during the summer months um, and if they're not able to do it successfully they will not have sufficient fat reserves to um, sustain them especially for the northward migration um, in the following spring. So this is something we're still paying close attention to. Um, I mentioned leptospirosis in sea lions. This is again, something that we're likely to be seeing in the next few months. Um, and this is marked by an inability of a sea lion to uh, be able to maintain a proper fluid balance in the body. Um, it's a kidney infection. 
um, and the animals become dehydrated um, and um, they also develop secondary infections um, as a result. Um, and if you see a sea lion that's seeking out fresh water to drink, um, that is often a sign that the animal has leptospirosis. This is a disease that's transmissible both to people as well as to dogs. So it's a good reason to keep your dogs away from sea lions and certainly not to um, wander into places where sea lions have recently been hauled out. Um, it's a good reminder too to maybe get your dog vaccinated against leptospirosis if possible. Um, we do see a fair number of human interaction cases, as I've mentioned. Um, gunshot wounds are um, the most prevalent um, up in the North Coast, especially around the Columbia River, um, where um, Portland State University um, is responsible for stranding response. Um, Dr. Debbie Duffield is my good colleague up there, and she's been studying these animals for decades. And um, I'd say the majority of the sea lions that she necropsies actually have gunshot wounds on them. Um, which is a sad situation, unfortunately. Um, we do see a fair number of uh, those sorts of things happening in other parts of the coast, but not nearly to the extent that they happen up north near the Columbia River. Um, we do get a fair number of entanglements with pinnipeds as well. Um, and at the Bayfront here in Newport in particular, we see a fair number of sea lions with debris entanglements. These are basically pl plastic packing bands that get wrapped around the necks of sea lions. And the reason is because sea lions are very curious animals. If they find something in the water that's novel to them, they're very likely to want to investigate it. They might stick their nose in it and just see what it is um, using their whiskers, as Shay mentioned, the vibrissa are their sensory organs. And they will you know, explore things. They're very curious animals. Um, but unfortunately, once a, a, a plastic packing band gets around their necks, they have no way of getting it off. Um, and over time, the band will cut down into the animal's neck. You can see in the picture in the upper right of this slide, um, the severe injury caused by a, a packing band. Um, we have also had animals entangled in trawl nets and, and other things. Um, if we want to try to disentangle a sea lion, we have an option of an isolation cage, which we actually have currently set up in Newport right now. Um, we occasionally um, will deploy that cage if we have recently seen an entangled sea lion. And we did see one about a month ago, just before they headed down south to California. Um, once they return in full force, there will probably be too many sea lions in Newport to make that cage practical to use, since they will probably be 30 or more sea lions piling inside of that cage at a time. It's, it's one of their favorite places to haul out, it turns out. Um, and perhaps one of the best ways we might be able to treat an entangled sea lion would be by darting it with um, drugs using a, a cocktail of several different um, drugs that have been developed by veterinarians over the last few years. Uh, but this is a risky endeavor and it does require authorization from NOAA Fisheries. Uh, there's only a few veterinarians that are currently authorized to provide um, what they call remote sedation of sea lions, but it is something that we are very interested in developing um, us to be able to do in the future. Sometimes we'll have an entanglement case that's relatively easy to treat. Um, this is a young northern fur seal that came up in Winchester Bay um, in Douglas County a few years ago. Um, it was picked up and um, it was brought to the Oregon Coast Aquarium for quick treatment. Um, they were able to um, remove the material. It turns out it was plastic twine. It looks like it probably came from a balloon that somebody had released into the air. And once you release a balloon, it's gonna come down somewhere at some point. And unfortunately, they sometimes come down in the ocean. Um, where marine life is likely to encounter it. It appears this northern fur seal probably did encounter a balloon, got it wrapped around its neck, uh, but was lucky to be rescued and uh, was treated. Uh, the aquarium um, gave it some antibiotics and some um, subcutaneous fluids. And uh, the next day we brought this um, little fur seal pup to Yukwena Head, uh, just north of Newport. and. Um, put a flipper tag on it in case um, it were to come ashore again, we'd be able to um, identify it and follow up on its case. Um, but this was a nice happy ending to this animal's entanglement saga. 
um, it was a quick, easy um, treatment, and uh, he went back into the water and was not seen again. So we hope he's living long out there and prospering. Uh, we do get entangled whale reports as well. Um, we get many more reports than there probably are actual entangled whales off the Oregon coast. People often will cite a whale close to shore in proximity to whale gear and assume that it's entangled, again, because gray whales will forage for long periods of time in very confined spaces. Um, but we do have con confirmation of, on average, about three entangled whales per year. Um, these could be gray whales, or in some cases, they're humpback whales. Um, some humpbacks are um, actually, they belong to uh, what are known as um, endangered discrete population segments. Um, so there are strong conservation concerns about um, any human caused mortalities of these humpback whales in particular. Um, we do have a team here at Oregon State University that's uh, trained and equipped to respond to entanglements of large whales, but it is a very dangerous endeavor and it does again require um, authorization through NOAA Fisheries and working um, with them to uh, make sure uh, it's done safely and in accordance with their strict protocols. Um, if you do have a sighting of an entangled whale, we do have a hotline number um, to call to report that entanglement, and that will trigger actual response that goes beyond us here in Oregon. It will notify folks up in Washington as well. Um, we have some partners with a group called SR3 um, who are extremely well experienced and um, very skilled at whale disentanglement, and we work very closely with them. They have been providing us training on whale disentanglement. So um, if you do encounter an entangled whale, please do report it as quickly as possible so we can try to get out there to help it. And I thought I'd finish up with some sea otters. Um, many folks don't realize it, but sea otters um, have been sighted on the Oregon coast for several years now. Um, we do not have a population of them in Oregon, although they did exist here um, up until the early 20th century when they were um, pretty much extirpated from the Oregon coast, um, but they are considered a keystone species and um, it is likely that we will see them returning here um, over the course of time. Um, we do get a lot of reports of what people think are sea otters, which in many cases turn out to be river otters, which are a different species. Um, river otters um, will forage along the ocean shore and in many cases they are very adept at swimming in the ocean and learning how to um, catch crustaceans and mollusks. Um, but one way to tell them apart from sea otters is that they are very um, quick on, on the, the shore. They will scamper along or people will describe their behavior as frolicking or running around playfully. Um, these are not things sea otters are even capable of doing. Um, sea otters are very slow and awkward on land and they do not move easily when they're out of the water. Um, but we do have verified um, sightings of sea otters in Oregon, and we've had a multitude of strandings of sea otters in Oregon, basically since 2008. That's really when our records of sea otters in Oregon began. Um, and we are now seeing them regularly every year. Um, in fact, this year alone, we've seen six sea otter strandings along the Oregon coast. And we've had a few in Tillamook County um, at Cape Lookout um, and at um, Cape Mears. Um, so this is something that you might wanna keep your eyes out for. Um, sea otters are thought to be making their way south from the outer coast of Washington. Um, my understanding is the population of sea otters on the Washington coast has been growing at about 8% per year um, and very slowly and surely um, these animals seem to be expanding their range southward. Um, it seems that we're mostly seeing young males um, that are making their way south into Oregon. Perhaps they're exploring uh, new um, areas to exploit. Um, there are certainly a lot of food resources um, that they might want to exploit here in Oregon. Um, and there are a number of places that have been identified by some researchers as, as potentially um, favorable habitats for them. So we'll, we'll see what happens uh, in time with sea otters. Um, the last group
group of animals I want to mention are not mammals at all. Um, they're sea turtles. And um, you might be wondering why I'm mentioning sea turtles. Um, the fact is they are considered to be protected species the way marine mammals are, and um, they are species of special concern. Um, all sea turtles are considered either threatened or endangered. Um, and although we don't have sea turtles per se that live along the coast of Oregon, we do get strandings of sea turtles every year along the Oregon coast, and it's generally during the winter months. Um, we believe some of these turtles are making their way up from places along the Central American coast, the Mexican coast, um, and somehow they find their way in the Pacific Northwest. Um, these are animals that are really adapted for warm waters. They really can't tolerate waters that are below 60 degrees or so. Um, and once they get into our cold water environment, they become hypothermic and they're just not capable of, of swimming anymore. Um, but in some cases, they will come ashore still alive. And um, we work with the Oregon Coast Aquarium and they are equipped to um, provide rehabilitation. Um, we've sent 19 turtles to them since 2009 and a fair number of them have survived and in most cases, they've been transported down to Southern California um, for release back into the ocean. So if you see a sea turtle on the beach, please do not put it back into the water. Um, they, are, they cannot survive uh, in, in the cold waters of the Oregon coast. Um, if it's a live turtle, it really needs to be collected and, and brought into rehab. Um, and if it's dead, uh, please report it as well. We still want to collect it, do a necropsy on it. Um, and in some cases, the animals are actually not dead. <laughs> they may appear dead, but hypothermic turtles um, can, in many cases, be salvaged and, and brought back to life, so to speak. So if you're wondering how you might be able to help, um, we are always grateful for anyone who can provide us with reports of sightings um, of, of live animals or dead animals. Um, if you are able to let us know about an animal that you see, if you can photograph it, um, send us pictures by text or email, um, and any details about the animal's condition, um, a specific location is, is really extremely helpful, especially if it's a live animal and we need to get somebody out there um, to respond. Um, if it has tags or brands, um, it's very helpful to know um, the numbers on those. Um, we can report them to ODFW or to whatever agency may have uh, done the tagging or branding. Um, and again, digital pictures are, are essential. They have transformed um, the ability of stranding networks to, to do the work we do. Um, and certainly, if you can help educate others about uh, marine mammals on the beach, um, especially if people are acting inappropriately around them, um, it's, it's helpful to let people know um, what's best for the animals. It's often hard to tell people not to do something, but giving people positive messages about um, the animal's needs um, is always very helpful. And I just want to point out that the CERNI network is really an umbrella term used to describe a multi multitude of organizations, nonprofits, agencies um, that work together um, to, to help make um, it work. So I am enormously grateful to um, our to participants um, on this list, and I've probably missed some people, um, but we are indebted to all the help that we get um, from anybody who, who reports stranded animals and helps to respond to them. So thank you very much. And with that, there's my contact information. Um, feel free to contact me and um, let me know if you have any questions. And thank you for listening. And I'm sorry I dropped out earlier. <laughs> Thanks, um, Jim. I really appreciate it. Um, again, feel free to um, drop your questions in to the chat box um, and we will ask them. You know, we had this uh, one question come up and actually had another question um, privately that was similar. One was, are there any endangered mammals so I, and I had a similar question about particularly pinnipeds, you know, what's the stability of populations? Are any listed, previously listed or threatened to be listed? Um, so if you guys could collectively address that, that'd be wonderful. Um, 
as far as pinnipeds go, uh, at this point in time, I believe the Guadalupe fur seal is listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and I think the northern fur seal is con considered a depleted species under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, as far as cetaceans go, a number of large whales are considered endangered. In fact, most of the large whales are, um, or at least some populations of them are. Um, smaller cetaceans, I don't know of any that are considered threatened or endangered that are on the Oregon coast, but please correct me, Shay, if, if, if that's not correct. For the, for the smaller ones? Yeah. I don't think so. And, and really, frankly, with a lot of the smaller cetaceans, we don't have all that much data uh, beyond some um, designated, you know, transect observation studies off the coast. Uh, they're they're pretty elusive, and uh, we're always discovering more um, species uh, within the or, you know the Oregon area or West Coast that we didn't realize we were part of their range. So um, pretty pretty data deficient in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. um, I do get a question a lot that I think would be great to address um, to everybody here. Um, when we talk about, you know, stay, keeping a distance from a marine mammal, people often say, but I was kayaking and the seal came right up next to me. And so um, can you guys kind of address that? It's like a common kind of stress for some people as they first learn about um, marine mammals and keeping distance. Can you kind of address this idea of like causing distress as part of the rules for keeping these animals safe and comfortable? Yeah, well, I'd say if you're out in a kayak and you're not approaching a haul out and a curious harbor seal or sea lion comes up to you, you're not harassing the animal. Um, it's happened to me. I kayak and I've, I've had that happen to me. It can be startling. <laughs> it can be exhilarating. Um, but it, I wouldn't consider that to be harassment if, uh, you know, you just happen to be out there doing your thing and the animal comes upon you. But you also need to exercise judgment in terms of how closely to approach a hole out if you're paddling. And my understanding is kayakers can actually be a lot more disruptive to a hole out than a power boat is. Um, a lot of pinnipeds have become very habituated to power boats, but a kayak um, can really create a startle response in pinnipeds, perhaps because the profile of a kayaker might resemble the dorsal fin of a killer whale. Mm. That's been speculation that I've heard anyway, but I don't know. Shay, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, I think that was a really, that was a really great answer. Um, you know, and again, what I would say is, you know, a lot of pinnipeds don't have the best eyesight out of the water. And so just like Jim said, you know, anything approaching from a distance can seem pretty threatening to them. And the rule of thumb we use for any of our permitted activities is um, if we see a change in behavior of the animals, so if they're resting and we get to a point when they lift their heads up and look at us, we actually, we list that as a, a take on our permit because we've changed the behavior of that animal. And mm -hmm. um, But I've certainly been out in the intertidal tide pooling and come over a ridge and all of a sudden there's a harbor seal pup there. That you may not have seen and and that happens when you're out in the wild um but you know in that case it's just the best thing you can do is just kind of kind of back away and give it space um very different than harassing a marine mammal for example so um we just share the shore and uh just have to be conscientious like jim said that when they are on land they're resting so um you know it's the same idea if you kept trying to sleep and somebody kept walking into your bedroom, you know, and, or, you know, talking loudly, you would, you would be exhausted because you would never be able to rest. And, um, you know, I think that's the main message. Perfect. It reminds me of when we teach kindergartners and we talk about, you know, if you're picking up an animal, would you want some giant to come in and pick you up by your leg and shake you around? Right by that. Um, well, I did want to, um, I did want to share with everybody before we sign up and again, um, uh, 
if there's more questions, we can answer them as they come in. But I did want to take a second just to share that we are looking to try and get some more local volunteers that can help respond when marine mammals come to shore here locally. And we're going to invite Jim back for another presentation in late winter, early spring um, to do actually more of a training so that we can get um, a team of people in our local area that are knowledgeable and able to respond in these cases when we do have marine mammals coming um, ashore for whatever reason it is, whether it's a resting pup or it's a, a stranded animal that might be sick. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm kind of curious who here might be interested in that. So I'm going to put a link to a Google form that you can fill out. And if you're interested in learning more about the training opportunity, or if you wanna get involved, this is the place to um, share your information and then we will get everything to you um, so that you can know and stay in touch with this group that we're hoping to form here locally. Um, and so why I was saying that, of course, more questions came in. And so um, there's a question about the app um, that was on the screen. And then a follow-up question is, um, should large fish that are stranded be reported? That's a good question. I get people reporting things like that to me a lot. And there really isn't any group that I'm aware of that is collecting that information right now. Um, well, it's we a get, curiosity as much as anything else, but anyway. Yeah, yeah. and we get actually a lot of, these are some of my favorite things is what, you know, that game of what is it on the beach. Uh, and we've gotten some really interesting finds reported to Department of Fish and Wildlife. And, and for fish, I would recommend that because that's one of the ways we're learning about, um, you know, tropical fish ending up in Oregon uh, because of warming oceans. Yeah, there are some interesting things up in Seaside lately. So I remember um, hearing about uh, I, one person here sharing that they found a large sturgeon washed ashore. And I have seen similar things like that, although it's been a long time. Yeah, we've got um, mola mola reports periodically mm -hmm. and uh, long nosed lancet fish. Yes. Sometimes reported. And yeah. Uh, used to have I think a the. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Jim. Well, we used to have uh, somebody at Hatfield who was collecting that information, but he retired a couple of years ago. And I don't think that anyone has sort of taken up the reins to collect that information at Hatfield. Um, Shay, do you know anyone at ODFW that's specifically collecting information about fish? Yeah, um, well, I would just say the best contact is the Marine Resources Program within the Department of Fish and Wildlife, because essentially what happens is, um, like when somebody sees an OPA fish or something unusual, that will go to marine resources and we all get sent it and a lot of it is what is this thing and usually somebody will know. So that, that's a great place to send unusual looking fish and that is really helpful information. Okay, that, and, that's good. And if you see a, a tagged pinniped seal or sea lion, we love to see that too, because that lets us know um, how long animals are out there and, and what they're doing, so. Yeah, I remember, um, I mean, I think Jim mentioned this too, and I remember from talking with you previously is you, you want to know if there's a marine mammal ashore, right? And we're not talking about marine mammals hauled out in the bay, but if you see a mammal on the beach, it's something that you guys are very generally interested in knowing about, um, even if you are aware that the animal's fine and be exhibiting natural behaviors. All right, so that's something kind of important to um, remember for folks too. Um, again, I did put that Google form link in uh, the chat box. I think I sent it to Shay privately first. For some for some reason, my chat box defaults to whoever messaged me last. <laughs> um, so um, I put it in there one more time for everybody. Um, and I just want to take this moment to thank um, both our presenters for coming tonight um, and sharing this great information. I think it was wonderful to get highlights on the harbor seals specifically. It's great to see, you know, that 
what's going on with our local populations, a glimpse into that. And it's also really wonderful to um, learn a little bit more about what's um, how to respond and what to know about when these different animals come ashore. So I really appreciate you guys giving us your time and presenting with us here. Um, and just for everybody viewing this, if there's anything that you missed, um, we did record this program and we will put it up on our website. And we will also put it up on our YouTube channel and social media sites. So you can come back and view it again and um, get that little factor detail that you that you missed. Um, and um, finally, we do have some more things coming up. So you can, um, you know, kind of block it out on your calendar. The registration for these opportunities will be coming live this next week. But we have a salt marsh tour. Um, that's August 21st. We have a Birdie on the Bay program with Portland Audubon on August 28th. And then for our volunteers or those of you that are interested in volunteering, we are offering a deeper dive training on Natarts Bay formation and its habitats um, on the 29th of August. Um, so these are just some things to be looking for and looking forward to. And um, we hope that you will join us on them. These will, except, with the exception of the volunteer training program, be in person, um, which is fun. Um, we are limiting the size for health and safety reasons. And so if you're interested, please register quickly so you can grab your spot. All right, well, again, I thank everybody for joining us and I hope everybody has a wonderful night and um, we'll see you on the bay. Take care, everybody. Bye.